We had a good look at uh, Rusty Schweikert as he was holding a checklist there, a test pilot's checklist. And as the, uh, as the camera came on, they were uh, just replenishing the supplies in the portable life support system, that large backpack that, if you were with us earlier today, you saw Rusty Schweikert wearing on the front porch of the lunar module. Uh, that has a four-hour supply of oxygen and uh, cooling liquids in it that can be replenished, and they were filling up that uh, uh, support system again, bringing it up to the top. About 40 minutes of it had been used in Rusty Schweikert's walk this morning. They want it up to full capacity uh, in case uh, any emergency should require egress from the uh, spacecraft. They don't expect that, but they could use the PLSS in that case. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 9 will continue in a moment. Forget everything you've ever known about size. Forget that an inch exists. We're taking you into a world where a speck of dust is a boulder and a human hair a rod. It's a sub-miniature world that we're working in now at Western Electric and Bell Telephone Laboratories. A world of complex electronic circuits. Some so tiny they can pass through the eye of a needle. At Western Electric, research engineers are finding new ways to make, test, and assemble these circuits. We'll be making them by the millions for new phones and equipment Bell Telephone companies will use to serve you. This is the kind of thing we do at Western Electric, finding new and better ways to make the things your phone calls are made of. We might go out now to Grumman Aircraft in Bethpage, Long Island, where Steve Rowan is with test astronaut Scott McCloud in the simulated lunar module. Perhaps they can tell us a little more of what we have just seen on uh, television from the spacecraft itself. Steve, Scott? Walter, once again, it appeared that the uh, television camera, the new device made by Westinghouse for use in the lunar landing mission, was mounted uh, near the commander's window. Scotty? I got it. I think they mounted it right about over here, Steve. We what? could see Jim in this position and Rusty over in that position. Rusty over here was working uh, with this water gun. I think he had just finished replenishing the water supply in the portable life support system and uh, noticed that he took a drink from that gun. Yes, uh, he did. Pressing the button. Jim uh, was eating over there, wasn't he? Yes, he was down in this area uh, eating. Uh, now they moved the camera around and what did we see? Well, one thing they asked for was the front panel. And the reason they couldn't see that was the ISA, the interim stowage assembly, was there. That's a series of uh, bags, something like this, that uh, hang up for periods yes. of time when they're, uh, when they're using this area to stow things. Gear is stowed in that, just loose. <coughs> they did uh, show us a view out the docking window, though, rather spectacular view. The docking window is right up here. And I would assume Jim held the camera something like this. He said he held it right up to the window itself and pointed straight up at the dock command module above. You could see what uh, looked like railroad tracks on that docking window. Those are the uh, markings on which they cite for docking, correct? Yes. Uh, let's see, they uh, then went back to the hatch and uh, it looked to me, Scotty, as if they were using one of these little portable lights. You well, the hatch, lights. the hatch would be rather dark when they looked up there and when they were holding the camera up, they'd get a very poor view. So Rusty probably picked up one of the utility lights and shown it up the hatch. These can be uh, clamped almost anywhere around the spacecraft and uh, used for just the purpose that you'd use them for if they were in your home. <laughs> yes. Right? Uh, so, uh, Walter, they gave you a little bit of a tour of, of uh, this, this spacecraft, which, as you say, is about as big as two telephone booths and which can get to be awfully small. Interesting, again, Scotty, that they had their helmets off, their gloves off. Uh, Rusty, apparently, was standing um, perhaps not restrained, but perhaps with Velcro. Was well, Jim floating around? I don't think either of them were restrained, but really you couldn't tell too well from the picture. The Velcro would hold them down on the floor. Okay, Walter. Right, what uh, they actually saw uh, there out the window, uh, as you recall, when they were so ecstatic on the ground at Houston, uh, 
Smokey Rusa, the capsule communicator, over the picture of Dave Scott. And we saw him just barely in the background there, uh, waving through the window. Well, we can show you on this model over here, that, uh, that rendezvous window is right up on the top, right there. You can just barely see it in there, uh, right down in that little corner is where it is. Now, that is the rendezvous window. It's a very small window, but by pointing the camera back there, they were looking right back up into here, into this window, where uh, uh, David Scott uh, was. That, uh, that was the view that they had uh, out of the window that you saw with your television uh, camera. The camera is a seven and a half pound uh, uh, instrument being used for the first time on this flight and it has a series of lenses with it for the lunar mission. Uh, it has only two on this particular mission, a wide angle and a, uh, and a long uh, lunar day lens, it is called. The uh, wide angle lens was undoubtedly the one that we were watching inside the uh, capsule today and also on the earlier tr uh, television transmission. It has a quite remarkable lens that will go with it uh, to the moon. It's called the lunar night uh, lens, and that lens is so sensitive that uh, in a demonstration of that Westinghouse camera, uh, it was uh, focused on a screen in a dark room, the screen having some uh, figures shown on it that could not be seen by the naked eye. But the television picture was perfectly clear as it was made in daylight. Uh, so that with that lens, they hope to get even nighttime photography on the moon when perhaps Apollo 11 gets there, and uh, that may be in July. This will be the last transmission scheduled at any rate uh, for the flight of Apollo 9. Just two were scheduled. Tomorrow's work schedule in the lunar module is so busy that it was thought they would not bother the uh, commander, McDivitt, and the lunar module pilot, Schweikert, with any television transmissions tomorrow. And then when they leave the lunar module tomorrow and climb back into the command uh, uh, capsule, uh, they send the lunar module on off into space, jettison it, the camera will go along. It is not uh, uh, adaptable to the command module itself. So this is probably the last transmission of the television from Apollo 9. Uh, this pass was made 153 miles over the United States, as you uh, saw, watched it a few moments ago. Earlier today, uh, McLeod, uh, uh, Scotty McLeod out there at Grumman, uh, did uh, the extravehicular activity along with Schweikert, who was doing it 153 miles up over us. Uh, McLeod, uh, Scotty, I wonder if you could come up again and we could talk about that uh, EVA activity. We saw Schweikert uh, this morning uh, doing a great deal out there on the front porch in the 38 minutes. He didn't make the full spacewalk that was planned, but uh, we saw you uh, duplicating those maneuvers. Was there anything about that operation that surprised you, or did you think it went just about as planned? Well, Walter, it appeared to me, from what I could see, that uh, Rusty's walk went just about as they had planned it. I saw no problems that he ran into. He did say that uh, the mobility of the suit seemed quite good when it was fully pressurized, and I think there was a comment about the cooling also in his gloves. Scotty, he mentioned that his hands stayed cool. Is, is that uh, unusual in spacesuits? Do your well, hands usually get hot? Remember, there is this liquid-cooled garment in this suit, and previously they had just blown the oxygen throughout your body, or on the surface of it. So this does give better cooling. It takes away the high heat buildup. That oxygen just never got quite down to the hands, I take it. Well, it got there, I guess, but certainly this appears to be better. Um, in the... Um in the activities tomorrow that Walter was mentioning, I think, of course, the important thing is the, is the series of burns that has to take place. The uh, descent engine is going to be burned again. Everybody's pretty happy that it burned very successfully yesterday. Oh, yes. It's going to be burned twice. I understand there was some cheering over in one of the plants here at Grumman uh, yesterday when Walter announced that uh, that burn was taking place. Uh, and then the ascent engine. Yes. Any difficulties uh, that you see ahead? No, none whatsoever. We have the utmost confidence in the vehicle. I'm sure the crew does also. The only untested portion for tomorrow, Scotty, now is, uh, well, of course, the two vehicles flying alone and not connected to the command uh, ship, but 
uh, is the ascent engine, the, the descent engine we had that test on, so now it's up to the ascent engine to work, right? And not connected to the command uh, ship, but uh, is the ascent engine, the, the descent engine we had that test on, so now it's up to the ascent engine to work, right? Yes, that's right. The two big stages are the ascent engine firing and then, of course, the docking following that. All right, thank you, Scotty. Uh, did a fine work out there today on the porch. Thank you. You look just as good as Rusty's Weikert. Must have looked 153 miles up and maybe even better. For <laughs> oh, I wouldn't hope. say that, no. <laughs> well, we'll be seeing a great deal of you tomorrow as we go through this, uh, the, the, the really critical part of the flight of, uh, of Apollo 9, which are the maneuvers of the lunar module away from the command ship as far as 100 miles tomorrow. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 9 will continue in a moment. Your family doctor sees something unusual. He wants to check with a heart specialist a thousand miles away. So with a medical data set made by Western Electric, your cardiogram instantly appears before the distant specialist for his analysis. Data speeds from machine to machine, and doctor talks to doctor over regular telephone lines to save time, to save lives. Western Electric makes other data phone data sets. So your Bell Telephone Company can serve you in other ways too, like helping banks rush data to give you faster service, helping airlines to request and confirm your reservations in seconds, making data phone data sets to move information at the speed of light is one of Western Electric's jobs as manufacturing and supply unit of the Bell system. One of the uh, problems with the television camera in space that was not faced today because the transmission was from inside the spacecraft is changing lenses once they get on the surface of the moon or Schweikert would have might have had that experience if they had tried to change a lens today if the walk had gone its full distance. Uh, the problem with those heavy spacesuits pressurized as they are uh, and uh, digital dexterity and the movement of fingers to change the lens on a camera is a pretty tricky job. Well, they've made this lens with a sort of a bayonet fitting that uh, can be handled in the spacesuit, and of course they've practiced with it a great deal. There is some talk even of putting a television camera on the surface of the moon in Apollo 11 perhaps or on one of the future lunar missions, a camera that would be left up there and transmit as the lunar uh, module, the ascent stage, takes off and goes back to the orbit command ship 59 miles overhead. Today, David Scott uh, had, a, had his uh, extravehicular activity, or it might be called mini extravehicular activity. Half of him was out of the uh, spacecraft as he stood up and retrieved a, a package, a test package from outside the spacecraft. And uh, just now he's had his picture taken by the lunar module's television camera out at North American Rockwell, Downey, California. Terry Drinkwaters with our test astronaut out there, Leo Krupp. Uh, gentlemen, uh, David Scott uh, was sitting there on his, uh, where, on the left-hand side of the aircraft when we saw that picture from back at the limb? We saw that picture from back at the limb? This was essentially the picture, Walter, that uh, we were shooting from the limb towards the spacecraft in which we're sitting, right, Leo? Uh, that's right, Terry. This is the shot when uh, Jim said he was looking at the docking target in the window of the command module, and he was sorry that he didn't have color TV, so you could see the colors. The back plate is green, and the front cross there is red, and of course, both are electrically illuminated. And he, he waved shortly before that shot. Uh, we didn't see him too well here, but waved out one of these windows inside. That's right. I assume he was in the left window and he must have waved, so uh, they probably could have seen him. And that's about all that uh, happened in this vehicle. <laughs> right. Walter. Thank you, Terry, and thank you, Leo Krupp, again.